بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وسبحان الله وسبحان الله الذي أنعم علينا بنعمة الإسلام وإنا له لمن الممتنين ونصلي ونسلم ونبارك على محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعوا بإحسان إلى يوم الدين Every for the past few Jumas For the past few Jumas I always have an intent or I always intend to come and give a Juma that contains a nice um, nice refreshing lesson in Taqwa in some aspect that elevates hopefully elevates one's piety and one's um, ibadah, the performance of one's ibadah. And for the past few Jumas, every Juma, events unfold one after the other. And as much as a lesson that would raise no eyebrows and cause no controversy and upset no one is extremely appealing. Extremely appealing for one thing, for me. Uh, I'm confronted with the same dilemma every Juma. People don't like the bearers of bad news and especially in our day and age, the age of the irony, the elevation of the individual to unprecedented heights, but the irony is that it is also the age in which the individual is deconstructed and rendered um, without identity in many ways. They're, they're, in the age where everyone is empowered to speak, no one gets heard. And when no one gets heard, people feel a deep sense of alienation. So in this type of age, people do not like to be confronted with moral absoluteness and moral certitude because ethics by their nature create a sense of obligation and a sense of duty. When we think of Lum, for instance, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَلَا تَرْكَنُوا إِلَى الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا Do not, and لَا تَرْكَنُوا is, is, a, is a profound expression. Do not surrender to the unjust. But it's not just surrender. It also means do not rely on the unjust. It also means do not become pacified by the unjust. It also means don't turn yourselves over to the unjust. 
if people think of zulm as something as concrete and also as distant as well this basically means do not embrace atheism or lack of belief in Allah or it means those who are unjust are those who do not do their salah that's something simple enough straightforward enough that it doesn't create a great it does not generate a great amount of burden on one's conscience and one's existential being in the modern age these are the type of nice compact messages that you can encounter, you can comprehend very quickly, and also you can more or less foresee that they will not have material consequences on your life and your lifestyle. They will not require you to change anything in the way, in, in the philosophy of your being, in the way that you carry yourself, in the way that you conduct yourself. And so you absorb these messages or you consume these messages because often the messages are so superficial that they don't require much to absorb. And you move on to your merry way. And it is precisely because of that, that in our day and age, that so many individuals lapse when it comes to moral and ethical reflection and find it quite easy to pollute the airwaves and the electronic waves with so much chatter, so much talk. The vast majority of the talk means practic absolutely nothing. You lodge into verbal battles, you withdraw from verbal battles, and the ethical moral consequences are largely mar marginalized and ignored. The dynamic of cheapening the word, of making words easy to produce, easy to consume, but with very little penetration in the human psychology and with very few demands on human consciousness. And this is why when we find that words become substantially meaningless, we move to the image, what helps us conceptualize, because conceptualizing is essential for thinking. So we move to the, what is filmed, the, 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 the moving image, i.e. cameras, i.e. videos. And videos help lazy intellects conceptualize and by helping them to conceptualize there is shortcut to thinking and that is why so many of us are drawn this day and age to video images and again the airwaves are full of video images but once again because we have become lazy when it comes to resolute moral thinking and the hard work it takes to understand the weight of the word and the seriousness of the word 
the word that is the basis of creation, the basis of the Quran, the basis of light. The hadith reported, and I don't remember the name of the Sahabi who reported this hadith, that Allah made the qalam from nur, the, the, made the, the, the pen, the intellect from light, and made the word from light, and the ink of the pen is from light. So this symbolic construct between the word, the revelation, and creation, is essential to our very approach to the idea or, or the, the, the weightiness, the seriousness of the word. But video images, which helps us conceptualize our shortcut to thinking with a flood of video images that we encounter in our modern media when you are simply overcome, submerged in, in, in tons of images, very quickly our intellects are overwhelmed and locked down and simply detach. And instead of conceptualization becomes an aid to thinking, we conceptualize, but we fail to think. And then the video image becomes a form of pornography. It becomes a form of distraction. We consume videos to consume videos. We consume videos in order simply to entertain ourselves, shortcut or uh, uh, consume time and pastime, but very little intermingles with our psyche and helps us learn the dynamics of thinking, and especially ethical thinking. Now, the irony, though, is that we live in a day and age in which, as I started out saying, every week I say to myself, I will start, I, I will give a khutbah on something that does not result in massive headaches to me. The consequences of which, of which will not be, in which there will be a high price to pay. And yet every week, After I do my final prayers the night before Jum'ah on Thursday before Fajr, my conscience will not let me go because the issues that confront us are so serious that time and time again I freeze at the point in which I think, what am I going to tell Allah? And there is a bit, what am I going to tell Allah for failure to speak about things that constitute in, in their heart, in their, in their essence, in their nature, alarming and bad news. So for instance, this past week, I was reading through a recent human rights report from Syria. The report documents 14,000 cases of Muslims, mostly Muslims, the vast majority of which were Muslims. 14,000 cases of people Men, women, children who died under torture. 
torture to death. If documents a million and two hundred thousand cases of Syrians who were arrested, imprisoned, and tortured at one point or another. A million two hundred thousand. Now, this is, of course, not counting those who have been killed, or who were killed in the Syrian civil war. This is, we're just talking about 14,000 people who died under torture in Assad's regimes, and a million two hundred thousand cases of human beings who have been arrested by the Assad regime, tortured, imprisoned, and whether released or not is a separate question, because as I said, a lot of them perish, and a lot of them are still in prison. The vast majority of them are still in prison. Of course, there is this moral question that you confront. What type of human being is so determined to stay on a throne that they are willing to have millions of souls perish and millions of souls tortured. The report goes on to document thousands upon thousands of cases of sexual assault that led to pregnancies and the plight of Syrian women as they struggle with the pregnancies that resulted from being raped by Syrian soldiers. Now you think, you think, with a human rights disaster of this scale, of this magnitude, you'd think that every responsible Muslim voice on the face of this earth is speaking out and demanding and clearly and unequivocally saying, Allah, I cannot meet you and be in any way complicit in this process. And so Muslims all over the world would be saying, unacceptable, must change. But then you quickly discover that most of those that you work with in the human rights field are not Muslim. And you quickly discover that there are so many Muslim institutions that deal with the situation as if It doesn't concern them. You would think with what is going on that our government, the American government, would be primarily concerned not with going to war with Iran, not with imposing brutal trade punishments against the Iranian regime, which, by the way, on the human rights side, is far better than Syria. <clears throat> they don't have a good human rights record, don't get me wrong. They have their own human rights failures. But if compared with the Syrian regime, there's no comparison. If you compare the human rights record in Iran to the Egyptian regime, there's no comparison. Egypt is much worse. And so, is, and so is Saudi Arabia, by the way. You would think that our government would be among its first foreign policy goals is to say those who murdered millions, who raped hundreds of thousands, who tortured millions, cannot be allowed 
to rule with impunity. But you find no, no our, our our for our government, their priority is not does not have to do anything with Syria or the Syrian regime. They're going after Iran. After the horrendous bloodletting and chaos that we as Americans created in Afghanistan and in Iraq after the millions murdered in Iraq in a war that was entirely pointless that led to hundreds upon thousands and thousands and thousands of American dead and wounded and Iraqi dead and wounded, you think that the old excuse of weapons of mass destruction people would be alert to, aware of. People would say, oh, we saw this old trick once before. Yeah, you invaded Iraq and you killed millions of people under the guise of weapons of mass destruction. We're not going to play this game again with Iran. Make a better, humane world so we can all live in. So we can elevate the standard of justice. You would think. But no. Our government has a different priority. Our government and it's not just our government, but the Assad regime, this criminal, barbaric regime, cannot be if it hadn't been for the fact that at this point Egypt supports it. Leave alone Russia, which is another story with its own criminal record. But even the Gulf states, which at one point clearly stood against it, dropped their opposition to the Assad regime. People, again, from a human rights perspective, because ultimately what I believe is in Allah's eyes, and I've said this many times before, Allah gave us this earth in a relationship of istikhlaf, Allah made us as human beings, vice germs on this earth. And Allah is not going to come in the final day and say, okay, were you pro-Ikhwan? Were you pro-Salafis? Were you pro-Wahhabis? Were you pro-Shia? Were you pro-Sunnah? Were you pro-Sufis? Were you pro-this, pro-that? Allah is not going to care about any of that. Allah is going to care about Justice and injustice. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We dignified human beings. Did you live up to that standard of dignifying human beings or did you degrade human beings? The labels will matter nothing. We human beings, because we are stupid, we play labels. We sit there and say, Sufi, Ikhwani, Salafi, Wahhabi, I don't know what, Republican, Democrat, whatever. They, for Allah, mean nothing. Absolutely nothing. Did you suffer? Did you suffer unjustly? Who made you suffer? Who was complicit in your suffering? Who kept silent as you suffered? Your salah, your psalm, your zakah, that's wonderful. You will get rewarded for that. But there is another bill to pay. The bill of istikhlaf. The bill of inheriting the earth in Allah's name. That bill is what wears me. I control how many prayers I do. And it doesn't cost me anything to pray. I, I can pray a hundred rakahs. I do them in the privacy of my home. It's between me and Allah. But where bravery counts, where material interests count, no one pays me for my prayer. 
But you know what? People will pay me for my silence. And that's why this matters. Because your speech will cost you. And your silence will reward you. That's why that matters. The same week, this past week, working on a case with an Egyptian lawyer, I don't want to mention the name of the Egyptian lawyer so that she doesn't get harmed. Just to give you an example, A client in Egypt, a woman who's a journalist. The woman who's a journalist was arrested. She went down to take photographs of a demonstration. She was arrested by security forces in Sisi's Egypt. And of course, as usual, accused of belonging to an unlawful group. Uh, spreading false information. She's been in detention now without, the charges have been changed several times, but without trial for three years. So the last hearing, the woman appears for her court hearing, a renewal of her detention, detention every 45 days. The woman appears and she is held up by fellow prisoners and she is gushing blood from her mouth. Her lawyer is horrified by the image. She was gushing blood in the truck that brought her from prison. She's gushing blood in the military court in which she is being tried. She is gushing blood before in the hearing and she's unable to speak. The lawyer tries to get the judge to order that she be transferred immediately to a doctor. The court basically says, well, she can see the prison doctor. The lawyer says the prison doctor is not specialized. We're internal medicine and doesn't even have the equipment and is not even present today. The judge said, then she goes back to her cell, she can see him tomorrow. The woman keeps gushing blood, and she can't speak, and finally the prisoners lay down her, lay, lay her down on the floor in the corridor, and officers are going and coming and stepping over her, and at the end, the judge renewed her detention, sent her back to her cell, ordered her return to her cell, and with a, an, the judge attached an order to be seen by a doctor, but the prison doctor. And if you know anything about prison doctors in Egypt, that's a, that's a death sentence. The lawyer then works tirelessly to find out why is this woman gushing blood? She was told by one of the officers, oh, she has epilepsy and she bit her tongue. But then we discover that that's completely false. She doesn't have an epilepsy and she didn't bite her tongue. She's gushing blood because she has a tumor that has not been treated and is not being treated and the government doesn't want to treat it. Now, I, because I believe that Allah will hold me responsible if, my shut, if I shut my eyes and live a blissful, easy life, I am a law professor, I can go teach my classes, I can get paid my salary, I can take some legal cases on the side in, the, in, in commercial law, I can charge $600 an hour or $750 an hour, depending on the case, and I can take care of my family and buy homes and buy cars and ignore the rest and live a happy life. But why don't I? 
for one reason. I will meet Allah for one reason and one reason only. I will meet Allah. And Allah is going to say, I didn't make you born to a poor, starving family in Egypt, in one of the villages, eating from garbage dumps and going around hungry, you know, dizzy from hungerness every night. I made you born in a family that educated you, that gave you opportunities, that sent you to the U.S. and then in the U.S. I facilitated things until you became a U.S. citizen and you got a law degree and I did all of that to see what you're going to do about this woman. That's what I'm scared of. If I am ridiculous, tell me. If I am absurd, let me know. If I don't understand why Islam correctly, tell me so. Because so often, you feel like a voice in the wilderness. You feel you're alone. And when I shouldn't feel like that. When I work in the human rights field, I should find plenty of Muslims around me, buzzing with activity around me because they all know and understand their faith in the only way that is possible. It is not just about Salah and Psalm and Miswak and Beard. But you know what really hurts? And I'm sorry to come back to this. I really am. What really hurts are those Muslims, especially Egyptian Muslims, who was as much effort as a press of a button can know everything about this woman, can know her education, can know her background, can know her jobs, can know her, her entire resume. And they come to the United States and then they say, you're not allowed to speak about her. What do I... The government in Egypt is a fascist government. Israel, who enjoys a democracy that is largely run for the benefit of Israeli Jews, Arabs and even Ethiopian, Abyssinian Jews have great problems in Israel. But recently Netanyahu praised Sisi as a great hero. Our President Trump praises Sisi as a great hero at the same time that this president that we fund and arm and support and praise as a great hero has a human rights record that is identical to a fascist regime. The hypocrisy is overwhelming. We call Iran an oppressive state and dream of freedom for the Iranian people, but we tolerate Syria and we tolerate the fascist regime in Egypt and we tolerate the fascist regime in Saudi Arabia and the equally fascist regime in the United Arab Emirates. The hypocrisy is unbelievable. People, I am not asking my fellow Muslims to join a revolutionary movement. I am not asking them to give up their lives as the companions did in some jihad. I am not asking. I am simply asking that you take a moral principled stance within yourself and do whatever you can do and don't censor human beings when you want to speak the truth. I did what I did and what hurts. And I'll be honest with everyone that hears me. Not a single person in the Islamic Center of Southern California reached out to me. Not a single board member on, of the Islamic Center of Southern California resigned in protest. Not a single person said, this is unacceptable. How can, how can we stand 
for supporting a fascist government in Egypt? How can you censor a scholar of the caliber of Khalid al Fadl? I resign in protest. Not a single. Remember the Prophet ﷺ said that if you no longer stand up against injustice, meaning Allah gives up hope on you, gives up hope in you. Is this what I should believe? That there's no more hope in us? Should I just say there is no hope? We are useless? We are pointless? And just stay home? Or maybe I should just take on commercial cases and be paid $750 an hour and buy a Mercedes Benz and move to Malibu? Is this what I'm supposed to do? The people who fund the Islamic Center of Southern California enjoy deep luxuries in life. Why? Because they have business in Sisi's Egypt. Because they make money from what ignoring the suffering of over a hundred thousand political detainees tortured daily in Egypt. We are getting ready for a new genocide against the Iranian people. And at the same time that we allow our government to engage in this idiocy, in this insanity, we have no moral grounds to stand on. We suppose we support the fascist regime of Netanyahu. And it is a fascist regime. We support the fascist regime of Sisi, the fascist regime of MBS, the fascist regime of MVZ. We tolerate the fascist regime of Assad. We support the fascist movement of Haftar in a democratic Libya. We aid the, the military council in Sudan, or at least tolerate what the Emirates and Saudi Arabia do with it. We do nothing about the genocide in Yemen and continue our pouring and selling arms at the cost of little children and women and civilians that get slaughtered every day. How are we going to meet Allah? If people know the answer, tell me. If somehow I can tell Allah, this, you know what? Not my responsibility. Not my problem. Okay, show me your evidence. Because if you convince me, I'll follow your lifestyle. It's much easier. It's full of luxury and happiness. And Allah knows. Allah knows how exhausted I have become with all of us that have become. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salatu wa salam ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabihi wa taqaw bi ihsanin ila yawmi deen. Wa subhanallah wa bihamdi haqqahum wa khfirina wa afwanna ya Rabbi. You know what really hurts? <laughs> Nicki Minaj. Nicki Minaj. Nicki Minaj has more principles than a lot of people. I heard that Nicki Minaj was going to perform in Jeddah. My heart broke. This is the Hijaz. The land of the Prophet The land of the Prophet For Nicki Minaj to go to the land of the Prophet, the Hijaz, if, it, if Nicki Minaj went to Riyadh or Najd, maybe, maybe that would be something else. But to the Hijaz, if the Prophet came, came today, and he saw Nicki Minaj with her clothes and her 
words or song words and all of that. What would he say? Would he say, Walaikum Salaam? Would he, would he bless the dancing? Would he say, oh, Alhamdulillah, as long as you have, you have the men and women separated, then it's all halal. What would he say? But Nicki Minaj, and she was going to earn thousands and thousands of dollars, terminated her visit to Saudi Arabia in protest over Saudi Arabia's human rights. Human rights circuit. Wallahi al-Azim, I had respect for her. I respected her. At least she took a stand. And it's a stand better than my, a lot of my fellow Muslims who see what Saudi Arabia is doing in the Hejaz in the land of the Prophet ﷺ again. And see what the Emirat is doing and what Sisi is doing and do nothing. And not only do nothing but even censor Muslims who want to do something. Who would I respect more? Who should I respect more? You tell me, who should I respect more? You don't need intense jurisprudence. You don't need ijazas of the highest caliber. You don't need to have written a doctoral degree and taught for 30 years and studied with the greatest sheikhs. All you need is a moral conscience and just a reasonable mind. Before I close, again, for the sake of Allah, we live, it is an obscene thing, obscene thing, when we understand that the Trump administration, the one who represents us, because the current administration, whether they like it or not, represents all Americans, including Muslim Americans. This administration is deeply in bed with numerous Islamophobic forces in the society. And they have not made a secret of it. They have openly and, and openly admitted it and declared it to the world. Despite that, this administration is strongly supported by Saudi Arabia, strongly supported by the UAE, and countries, even countries like Qatar, which has a better human rights record than the Emirates or Saudi Arabia, but all of these Gulf Muslim countries support the Trump administration and have supported the Trump administration in a variety of ways. Without the money that they gushed onto the Trump administration, the Trump administration might have suffered if they simply said either you take a better position on Islam and Muslims, or we are not supporting you. And Trump is a businessman, and he understands the logic of pragmatics and practicality. And I assure you, I assure you, if that was their position, he would have immediately readjusted his inner circle. Because he cares about the dollars. He doesn't care about Christianity or any of that stuff. Nevertheless, this didn't happen. And not only did we support the Trump administration, as I mentioned before, we welcomed evangelists in Saudi Arabia, we welcomed evangelists in the UAE, we welcomed evangelists in Egypt, we welcomed, the, and not just normal evangelists, I'm talking about right-wing, Islam-hating, racist evangelists. Okay. That's all old news. We all know that, hopefully. But this administration that has made a mockery of human rights around the world, this is the same
same administration because of its disdain for human rights and human rights in the United Nations and its policies towards a human rights council and its policies towards the International Criminal Court and its attitude towards the Geneva Convention in which they don't even make no regard for it. This same administration with all its policies has resulted in what? In unprecedented human rights abuses in Yemen and Egypt and Saudi and the Emirat and Sudan and Libya. Leave alone the poor Rohingyas in Burma where we did very little. We could have done so much more. But this administration chose to do nothing. Leave alone the poor Uyghurs in China, two million in concentration camps, and this administration chose to do nothing because they are Islam haters. Bannon, if you ever watched Bannon, doesn't make a secret that he detests anything like the Prophet Muhammad and his message. So this administration that has destroyed the regime of human rights around the world. This administration that keeps thousands of children locked up in concentration camps on our southern border. If you bother to do some research about the state of these poor children, Wallahi Azim, not Iran, not Turkey, not even Syria has done with refugees what we've done. This administration declares that there is a proliferation of human rights and they're confused about human rights and they're going to create a commission to reconsider the doctrine of human rights. This was the idea of Robert George who is a natural law philosopher, but who is anchored in Christian conservatism. Robert George co-authored a book in which he critiqued liberal secularism with Annie, Mary Ann Glendon, the Harvard professor. Both of them have a long record of from their point of view, supporting only natural rights and opposing social rights and what they believe are created but unnatural rights. Both Mary Ann Glendon from Harvard and Robert George from Princeton Although Robert George in 2016 condemned Trump and told Christians that they should not support Trump, he changed his mind and saw Trump as a, as a, as a rare opportunity to Christianize the United States. Now, this commission is not going to, is not there to examine what we're doing with children at our southern border, is not there to examine the uh, genocide in Yemen, is not there to examine the, 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 the Holocaust in Syria, is not there to put pressure on the UAE to improve its, its abysmal human rights record, or Saudi Arabia, where we continue to support the Saudi government despite Gamal Khashoggi's murder and look at our what we've done with the human rights with the United Nations when the United Nations said you should investigate the murder of Khashoggi we strongly supported MBS and refused to allow the United Nations to do anything about Khashoggi's murder no the, the purpose of that commission the purpose of that commission is to roll back reproductive rights 
abortion rights, and gay and lesbian rights. Now, they appointed Hamza Yusuf to this commission. Sadly, sadly, this is the same Hamza Yusuf, the student of Sheikh bin Bayya, who have recently draw, developed a very close relationship with the United Arab Emirates, praised the generosity of the United Arab Emirates in numerous interviews, ignored the abysmal human rights record of the United Arab Emirates, and said not one word about the genocide in Yemen, not one word about Mariah Carey or what's her name, the other one, Nicki Minaj. Nicki Minaj in Saudi Arabia, and I'm joking because I don't care that they say anything about Nicki Minaj or Mariah Carey. I care about the human rights. Bin Baya was friends with Salman and Ola, and when Salman and Ola was thrown in prison, Bin Baya didn't say a word. When the United Arab Emirates declared Qaradawi a terrorist, although Bin Baya and Qaradawi were friends for a decade, Bin Baya didn't say a word. Bin Baya and Hamza Yusuf didn't say a word about the abysmal fascist human rights record in Egypt. What? What? Is this Ta'a? What do you do with the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ? When the Prophet says, there will be umara, there will be leaders. They will not follow my sunnah. And they will not follow my sharia. And then the companions ask, what do we do about them, the Prophet? He says, La ta'ata liman asallah. You, there is no obedience. No obedience can be given to someone who disobeys God. What do you do with that? So, appointed to the commission. It is the same philosophy that MBZ and MBS have, and CC have demonstrated and manifested towards Islamophobes. They work with them, they go to bed with them, they have breakfast with them, they have dinner with them, they have with them whatever they want to have with them. Hamza, don't go to bed. Allah told us, don't become appeased and pacified by the unjust. Or you will burn. And let me tell you, is not just refers to burning in the hereafter. That the acceptance of injustice leads to a fire on this earth. The fire of, that comes from injustice itself. The fire of broken hearts. The fire of people raising their hand and doing dua against those who have committed injustice against them. The fire of grievances and pain and agony that comes from oppression and autocracy. This is why one scholar after the other says, Ar-Rukun ay ar bima alayhi al-zalama min al-zulm wa tahseen tilka al-tariqa wa tazyeenuha indahum do not surrender, do not become appeased by, do not acquiesce with the unjust. The ulama, the jurists remark, this means to accept injustice, 
as injustice and the acceptance of injustice gives it legitimacy and legitimacy gives it credibility so when you work with Islamophobes instead of saying excuse me sorry you have said horrible things about Muslims you have the Muslim ban the UAE and Saudi Arabia never condemned the Muslim ban. These Islamophobes never condemned, they, they're the authors of the Muslim ban. The UAE has declared CARE a terrorist organization. And you are under Fiqh Council. Put one and one together. If they consider CARE a terrorist organization, and you are under Fiqh Council, so I, do you consider CARE a terrorist organization? And then when you go and get in bed with the Islamophobes, what is the result? What is the result upon Muslims? When the entire world, if Trump loses the next elections, I hope he does. And then the, the entire world looks at Muslims and said, you allied yourselves with the fringe right wing that fights reproductive rights, abortion rights, and gay and lesbian rights. Do we Muslims need that type of animosity and hostility? Are these the people that we want to ally ourselves with? Is this where our moral conscience, conscience and compass has led us? No, it is not an honor. Some people say, well, alhamdulillah, brother, they included the Muslim. If a fascist regime creates a committee to reconceptualize human rights, do you want them to include the Muslim? If a communist regime, do you want them to include the Muslim? So when a right-wing regime, right-wing Christian Zionist regime, you don't want them to include the Muslim. Because you don't want to be in bed with them. And I have two more points very quickly. One, all the people, on that committee, by the way, or commissioner, whatever it is, are professors, accomplished professors, who have a record of publication in peer-reviewed journals and presses. The Muslim representative is not a law professor, is not a professor of, is a professor that is a da'ya. And a, a preacher and and someone who helped found the Zaytuna Institute fine or a university, whatever. But he himself is not an accomplished academic. That to me shows me the extent to which they patronize Muslims. There are a lot of professors who Muslim professors who are very accomplished in the human rights field. But I tell you what. No accomplished Muslim professor that I know of in the human rights field would agree to serve in this commission. If they wanted names, I could have given them a long list of names. But I am sure not one of them would serve in a commission presided over by Mary Ann Glendon. And if you don't know Mary Ann Glendon, then you're not in a position to say this is what's great. If you don't know who she is, or what her writings are, then you're not in the position to say Mabruk, Sheikh Hamza. Then at a minimum, shut up! My last point. There is an excellent article that you should read to understand where Bin Bayya and Hamza Yusuf are coming from. It was published in a journal called Me Then, the author is Wala Kusai and Thomas Parker. 
that was published January 8, 2019. The article is titled on the theology of obedience, an analysis of Sheikh bin Bayya and Sheikh Hamza Yusuf's political thought. Very thought-provoking article. And I would have hoped that Hamza Yusuf himself would read this article and learn from it. It would have helped him on this earth and in the hereafter. Right? اللهم اعف عنا اللهم اغفر لنا واهدنا يا رب العالمين الله فرجف our sins guide us towards a straighter path الله help us see the light and serve you in every way possible يا الله يا علي العظيم forgive us forgive our excesses and our exigencies and our grievances يا الله